Hey, if you brought a Bible, open up to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, we are five weeks in to a, a message series. We're asking this question on the back of my shirt. Come on, what is it? That's right. Death, where is your sting? We're, we're taking seven weeks and just rubbing the devil's face in the fact he couldn't keep Jesus in that tomb. We're two weeks out from Easter. We're a week out today from Palm Sunday. You guys won't want to miss uh, next Sunday. We've got some exciting things. We've, we've so far in this series been following the final few hours of Jesus's life. But next Sunday, Palm Sunday, we flash back a week before all of the brutality to the scene where Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the donkey. You guys will want to be here next Sunday for that. And then two weeks from now, oh man, buckle up. Easter Sunday, Jesus is alive. We blow the roof off of this place. We're praying that's our final Easter here in Riverside Center, right? God's got something big for us elsewhere. So we're just going to have a blast. Two weeks. We're, we're believing uh, God's going to change, change a lot of lives over these coming weeks, um, as he's already been doing. And if you were here last week, we started looking at some of the trials that Jesus was going through. I'm not talking about trials as much as suffering. I'm talking about court proceedings, trials that Jesus was dealing with. Starting last week, we looked at the religious trials. So, so far, we've in this series, we've been, uh, we've followed Jesus and the disciples from the upper room into the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus marched confidently into the hand of his betrayer and a mob that came to arrest him. And last week, he began uh, three of six trials he would go through in a period of just a few hours where they would finally condemn him to death. The first three were religious trials. He appeared first before Annas, who was the father-in-law of the high priest. Then he went to Caiaphas, who was the high priest, and a few other Jewish religious leaders. And then finally, he went through, uh, went to a a large portion of the Sanhedrin, which was the 70 Jewish leaders, the council of leadership that was put in place to basically come, make, make uh, rules about Jewish law. And so they all, of course, putting, their, uh, putting as many liars together as they could, condemned Jesus to death. Well, now, today, they, they switch and they take him before the Roman government. And here's why. Because the Jews know that they don't have, although they believe Jesus is deserving of death, they don't have the authority to condemn someone to death. They have to have Rome involved. Rome came up with this idea of how to murder people in the most brutal way possible called the cross. And they want Jesus stapled to that tree in just a few hours. So they're going to bring, uh, they're going to bring Jesus before Pilate and before Herod. Um, and, and court, see, so what we're up against is, is a court trial. And court trials, uh, court proceedings are important in a lot of different ways. Cultures are often, they're shaped by the judicial system. What is allowed, what's not allowed. Um, laws, the judges, uh, juries make verdicts. And these all determine the way that a, a society functions. And you, you know, you, you guys know, over time, there are some, some landmark cases. There are some frivolous lawsuits that take place. I'm sure you guys could think of a few crazy ones that you've heard of. I, I read uh, this week about um, a lawsuit called uh, Kirkpatrick versus Snohomish County. And um, this guy, Kirkpatrick, was uh, a bank robber who sued the county to cover, cover his medical expenses after he attempted to rob a bank pointed a gun at a police officer, and the police officer shot him with non-lethal rubber pellets. He had to go to the hospital, and he sued so that the county would cover his hospital stay. Yeah, they, he dropped it, thankfully. I read about a, uh, a girl, uh, one case, um, Sands is her last name, Sands versus FedEx. She sued FedEx um, for, to cover medical expenses, and to cover uh, pain and suffering and mental anguish after she tripped over, quote, a negligently placed package that FedEx had delivered to her front door. She fell down and she goes, I'm going to sue you for that, for that package that I ordered and you brought to my door. Um, those are some crazy ones. There are many others. Then there are some landmark ones. Other cases that set the course of the history of a nation. Roe versus Wade, the legalization of murder, abortion. Um, 
There's uh, Engel versus Vitali back in uh, the 50s that said that prayer in public schools violated the First Amendment. And um, isn't it interesting to look at our nation over the last 60 years since that ruling was made and see how far in decline we've gone after we removed prayer? Um, many of you uh, s- gathered around TV screens just a couple decades ago to watch OJ and uh, the, the chase down the road and months of court proceedings and in the middle of racial tension, he was declared innocent and, and, and let go. And, you know, there are landmark cases like this that kind of set the tone for a country, for a society. And although there have been some big ones in our, in our nation and many others that I, didn't, that I didn't mention today, none have ever been as important as the, court, as the court proceedings that we talk about today in Luke chapter 23. I'm entitling today's message, write it down, The People versus Jesus Christ. Jesus goes on trial today in front of Pilate and Herod. He will be condemned to death. And this is the most important trial that has ever taken place in human history because 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. We're still affected by it. And the verdict of this case, amazingly, paved the way for us to get to heaven. It's that important. It's brutal. It's illegal. It's irreverent. It's wrong. It's sinful. And yet God takes all of those things because he's the redeemer and uses what the enemy intended for evil for our good and his glory. Amen? Amen. Luke 23. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read the first 25 verses. So it's a bit of reading. I'm going to kind of talk through it as we go, and then we're going to unpack it and get some principles to take home. Um, But you need to know today as we talk about the people versus Jesus Christ, that although Jesus went on trial 2,000 years ago, he's still on trial in a way today as we all make decisions about what we're going to do with Jesus. He's on trial in our hearts and in our minds, and we all have a decision to make about what we believe about Jesus. And if you don't know him today, I want you to be prepared that you have a verdict to come to today before you leave. God's going to give you an opportunity to say, man, I made the wrong decision, but I'm going to switch it, and I'm going to follow Jesus today. Let's read. Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 1. The whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ a king. Now, just stop right there. If you were here last week or if you've read the story, you know that none of the things they just listed right there are what they found him guilty of in their three religious trials. In their trials, they found him guilty of blasphemy. But do you notice that they didn't even mention a word about blasphemy to Pilate? Pilate, the Roman governor, couldn't care less about blasphemy. They know how to push the right buttons and say the things. They go, he's a terrorist. He's an insurrectionist. He's causing people to not pay their their taxes, which is a complete lie. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. They they bring all of these false accusations about Jesus to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, verse 3, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. You might want to pay attention to how many times Pilate declares Jesus innocent. But they were urgent, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee, even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. He goes, okay, here's my way out. My jurisdiction isn't Galilee. I'm going to send him to the guy whose jurisdiction is is Galilee. Verse 7, when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but Jesus made no answer. You remember Isaiah 53, 7? As a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. So, verse 10, the chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. The devil in the Bible is called the accuser of the brethren, and they are fueling 
he is fueling their accusations. Verse 11, Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, sent him back to Pilate. One of the other gospels tells us how they put a a royal robe on Jesus. They twisted a crown of thorns that was both mockery and torture. The crown of thorns was shoved onto his head, piercing, it's just pouring blood down his face. They're mocking him like he's a king, making fun of him. They sent him back to Pilate, verse 12, and Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. Isn't it amazing how, how Jesus and your beliefs about Jesus, hate him or love him, unites people. And here's, here's Pilate and Herod. They became friends this very day. Verse 13, Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, and he said to them, you've brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty. There's his second statement of innocence of any of your charges against him. Verse 15, neither did Herod. There's the third statement of innocence. For he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Four times, he says, Jesus is innocent. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection, started in the city and for murder. We want the murderer. We want, that's what they're saying. Send us the guy who killed people. We want him. Verse 20, Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. Five times he says, this guy's innocent. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. And I would add, he delivered Jesus over to the will of the Father. Let me give you a few things to write down from this. Um, Three things. Number one, let's start here. Sin is both lethal and illogical. Let's walk through this scene here for for just a moment. Um, Matthew chapter 27. And by the way, in case you're uh, new during this series, um, one thing that we've talked about is, is how the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament, form together, when you put them all together, they're kind of like four camera angles telling different angles of the same story. So throughout this series, we've opened up Matthew or John or Mark or Luke. Today we're in Luke, but I'm going to refer to a few different places because they give us a different insight. Matthew chapter 27 says that Pilate knew that they were delivering Jesus because of their envy. Envy led them to this scene. Envy, the sin of envy, the sin of wanting something that they couldn't have, that they shouldn't have, that they didn't have. Envy is the sin that caused them to murder Jesus and release the murderer. How backwards is this, right? How backwards is this? They set free a guy who took life and they murdered the one who gave life. This is backwards. It shouldn't be this way. And yet, as backwards as this is, let's talk about how illogical sin is. Sin causes us, it doesn't force us, but it causes us when we allow it to take over our minds and our hearts. Sin will cause us to do things that make no logical sense. Why would you release a murderer into the streets? Well, because sin is illogical. Because we start to do things when we allow sin to get in the driver's seat of our lives. We begin to do things that don't make sense. We begin to cut corners. We begin to hoard resources that God has given us when we should be generous with those. We begin to medicate our pain in ways that it's illogical. Think about it. Let's walk through a few examples. Sin is illogical. We, we, you're in pain. So the, the easy thing to do is to begin to medicate that pain with something that in the moment feels good, but in the long run is going to hurt you even more. 
we medicate with relationships, don't we? If I could just get with that guy or that girl, if I could just get out of this marriage and in with that guy or that girl, uh, I'll medicate my pain with alcohol. I'll medicate my pain with, go down the list, what you medicate your symptoms with. But I've, I, I've lived that lifestyle. I, I lived that lifestyle for too long. And I've just found that the more I medicate, the more I hurt. And, and it never heals anything. So it's illogical. It's illogical for us to try to use or, or to allow sin to drive us because we begin to do things that don't make sense. God has given us resources and connections and a gift and finances so that we can reach more people. And yet, you know what our problem in American church culture is, is that we would rather sit in a chair and be consumers instead of givers. Serve me. Come, 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 come take care of my needs. I don't want to go to that church because this, 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 this. But have you even tried to be a part of that, right? Like a church is not a, just a building. A building is just where the church gathers. The church is people. If you're a part of the church, you have a gift, you have finances, you should be contributing, not just consuming. But listen, what happens? Here's what happens. Greed drives us. You're surrounded, listen to me, you are surrounded by a city with tens of thousands of people who don't know Jesus. And many people, Christians, are content to just sit in a chair and receive because, why? Greed drives us. Uh, uh, weekends are my time off. I don't have time to just give, you know, go multiple services to church. Uh, no, I worked for that paycheck. I, don't, I, I can't just be giving that away. I'll, I'll tip God here and there only if the worship is real good on a Sunday. That's, that's the reality. Greed drives us. So, so if God gave his son, and then we're like, I'll give 10 bucks here and there. It's illogical. It's backwards. But this is what happens. See, sin is both lethal and illogical. It causes us to do things that just don't make sense. When greed drives, when envy drives, when lust drives, you end up doing things that don't make sense. It's illogical. The Bible says, are you going to play with fire and not get burned? Proverbs 6 and 7. But when lust drives, that's exactly what happens. You will get burned when you allow lust to drive your life. And there's a hundred other examples of how sin, when we allow it to take over our minds and our hearts, will drive, and it becomes completely illogical. We begin to do things that don't make any sense, such as, oh, I don't know, releasing a murderer onto the streets. It's crazy. But when sin takes control, we begin to live and, and do things that don't make sense. We begin to live like hell on our way to hell. Thank God Jesus died to set us free from that mindset. Amen? Amen. Now let's go a little bit deeper with Barabbas. I hate to tell you, but you're more like Barabbas than you think you are. So am I. They had this, uh, the Roman government had this weird tradition, of, uh, according to the Gospels, of releasing a prisoner at Passover. Makes, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. In the United States, we pardon a turkey on Thanksgiving. Okay, like that's one thing. But letting a terrorist murder robber go onto the streets, where, who came up with this bad idea? This is about as smart as releasing like a rattlesnake onto a playground, right? Like who, who's going to do that? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Also doesn't make a lot of sense to take a guy who got arrested for terrorism and riots and murder and robbery and just go, you know what? You could go, it's the Passover. Why don't you go free? Doesn't make a lot of sense. So here's Barabbas. He's a notorious murderer. Uh, the, the Gospels will paint the picture if you put them all together. He was a notorious prisoner, robber, murderer, insurrectionist, or, or terrorist. That's, that's, who, that's who this guy is that they want to release that Pilate wants to, uh, wants to use. He, see, Pilate wants to release Jesus, but the crowd is crying out for Barabbas. Now, against the backdrop, the black backdrop of how guilty uh, um, Barabbas obviously is, we contrast the innocence of Jesus. You guys read it with me in Luke 23. Five times that Pilate or Herod in one way or another made it clear Jesus is innocent. This man has done nothing deserving of death. I'm ready to release him. You're, 
the, the things you're accusing him of are not worthy of death. Over and over and over in different ways at different times in front of multiple crowds from different Roman leaders. They've said this guy does not deserve death. He's innocent. We just read five times in just a few verses where that statement has been made. And yet Barabbas is loosed into the crowd. It says in verse 25, we just read it. He, it, it Pilate let Barabbas loose. So think about this scene for a moment. They call Barabbas out of, out of the prison. I imagine what Pilate's trying to do is to help them remember, here's this Barabbas guy. I don't think you want him on the streets. But you remember our, our tradition, I'll release somebody since it's Passover. How about I just flog Jesus? How about I beat Jesus up pretty well? And then you guys can have him back all bloodied and, and bruised up. We'll, we'll teach him a lesson, but I'm going to keep Barabbas. And they go, give us the terrorist. Give us the murderer. So here's Barabbas. Can you imagine him on the front steps? Hey, daylight's looking pretty good, right? His hands are tied up. And then this crazy moment happens. They cut the ties on his hands. And he skips down the stairs into the crowd. Barabbas, free. They bind Jesus' hands and they lead him to the whipping post. A Roman flogging, we'll talk more about it on Good Friday. you got to be here Good Friday. A Roman flogging would often kill somebody before they even got to the cross. That's how brutal this was. It would be a bloody shred of a man by the time he was forced to carry the cross up the hill. Barabbas freed, Jesus beaten. Here's a takeaway for us. Number two, would you write this down? Number two. Jesus exchanged his righteousness for our rebellion. Barabbas uh, foreshadowed, Barabbas' freedom foreshadowed our freedom. Jesus literally took Barabbas' place, and he spiritually took our place. Barabbas going free and Jesus being imprisoned and beaten is a beautiful picture of what you might call the great exchange. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Here's what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Here's a, here's a basic summary. God treated Jesus how you and I deserve to be treated so that he could treat us the way Jesus deserved to be treated. It's the great exchange. My sin, my rebellion for his righteousness. Now, I, I don't know about you, but that strikes me as odd because you know you, I know me, my sin's ugly. Your sin is ugly. For, for me to get Jesus' righteousness and him to get my rebellion, this doesn't make a lot of sense. This feels a little bit backwards. Why would Pilate get released and Jesus get imprisoned? This doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And when I read this, I just keep thinking like, as I studied this this week, I thought, this is crazy that the Roman government didn't make this terrorist pay for his crime. That's crazy. And then it hit me. You know what's crazy is that God's not making me pay for my crime. That God hasn't, God's not making you pay for all of eternity for your crime. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Jesus said, either you take the death or I'll take it. It's up to you. You don't have to pay. How, how amazing is this exchange? His righteousness for my rebellion. It's the, the switch that took place. And, and, and here I think we see... In that story of the gospel, we see both mercy and grace at play. Think about it this way. We talk about those words, mercy and grace, all the time. They're found all throughout the New Testament, especially. We sing about them in songs we love, mercy and grace. Let me give you a quick definition of both so you understand the nuance that makes them a little bit different. Both are at play in your life as a follower of Jesus. Watch this. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Let me walk you through this. Mercy, I'll say it again, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. 
okay? Mercy is you don't have to go to hell for eternity for your sin. That's mercy. Grace is, oh yeah, also you get heaven for all of eternity. That's grace. Getting what you don't deserve. Well, what do we deserve? Our sin earned us hell, eternal separation from God. It's mercy that, that Jesus took our, our sin on his back so that we don't have to pay for our sin for eternity. That's mercy. But grace is that God paid the way for us to spend eternity with him in heaven. And um, how, how good is our God that both are at play in our lives? He didn't punish us with what we deserve, and he's gifted us with something we didn't deserve. Our rebellion for his righteousness. You with me, church? Yes, Come on. Our, our God's good. Amen? amen. So, so as we look at this scene, what's interesting to me is you have all of these different groups and people, leaders, government, religious people, sometimes a crowd, and they're all giving their, their, their take, what they believe should be done with Jesus. And even sometimes without them saying it, just if you look at their, their lifestyle and their actions, you can tell what they believe about Jesus. Did you know the same is true for us? Say whatever you believe on a Sunday. Say whatever you want when you're with Christians at a church. But your lifestyle ultimately is the thing that proves what you actually believe. Here it is. Here's the third point. Would you write this one down? Your verdict is displayed through your lifestyle. When you, the, remember, this is Jesus. This is the people versus Jesus Christ. What you, what, the verdict you have come to in your heart and mind about what you believe about Jesus it will be on display through your life, through what you do with your finances, through what you do in relationships, through what you do at your job, at your school, in your neighborhood, what you're listening to, what you're talking about, your overall lifestyle, your verdict, what you believe that should be done about Jesus is on display right now, like it or not, through your lifestyle. We're all living out what we currently believe about Jesus. If you believe God is big, you're going to pray like it. You believe God doesn't really come through, then you're not going to really pray. What's the point? If you believe God is the provider, then you're going to trust him with what he's given you. There are so many examples of this. And I want to just look real quickly at three different groups of people. We got the Jews, we got Herod, we got Pilate. Let's walk through because I wonder if you might find yourself in one of these crowds. Let's talk about the Jews first. The Jews represent for us Someone who Jesus just hasn't honestly measured up to their expectations. See, the Jews didn't hate Jesus because he did good things. And, and you, may, you may mistake that um, reading through the Gospels. You might actually start thinking that they didn't like Jesus doing nice things because they get mad at him when he heals somebody or they get mad at him for whatever but the reality is, it's not that they hated his good works. It's hate, it, they hated him because he didn't do those things in the way that they said he should. He hung out with the wrong people. He healed people on the wrong days. He didn't follow the right rules that they said he should, right? So the, the Jews are just a representation for us of people who had expectation. They said the Messiah should live and behave and fit in this box. And anybody outside of that, we're not going to like so when Jesus came and said, I am, they said, you can't be, you don't fit in our box. God goes, I created the box. Don't try to fit me in it, right? Well. So here's a question for you. Will you continue to worship God when he doesn't meet your expectations? What if he does things on a different timeline, in a different way, with different methods, with different people than you thought he should? By the way, if you doubt, you are in good company. All the disciples were doubters. John the Baptist himself doubted. Did you know that? John got thrown into prison. His disciples came to visit him. And John told, his, John told John's disciples, go find out if Jesus is actually the Messiah or if we should be waiting for somebody else. Even John doubted. I want you to know God is not put off by your doubts. Listen, here's what John did that we need to learn to do when you doubt, when God doesn't measure up to your expectations, when things are a little bit different than you thought they would be. Take those concerns back to Jesus. 
talk to God about it. The Jews remind us of people whose expectations are, are not met. Here's a second group. Maybe you could find yourself in this group. This, this is represented by Pilate. No, I'm sorry, by Herod. Herod, for us, represents someone who basically turns to Jesus for some entertainment. Um, you might have noticed in verse 8, it says that when Pilate sent Jesus to Herod, that Herod was real excited about it because he had heard about Jesus and was hoping to see a sign done by him. Do you know some people like this? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> We're all guilty of this at some point. I'll get to church because I know if I go to church, then God's going to bless me. If I go to church, if I just give enough, God's going God's to send some more my way. I, I just want to kind of like be around the, the things of God because maybe I'll get like some signs, some miracles in my life. We approach Jesus like he's, we begin treating him like he's a, a genie just granting wishes for finances and health. This is not the way our God works. But listen, if you approach him like Herod, you begin, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll get around with Jesus and Jesus' people because hopefully there will be like some cool things that begin to happen in my life. What if it's only suffering? What if he doesn't measure up to those expectations? Is he still worthy of your worship? Herod wanted, Herod wanted him only for some entertainment, only for him to please him. Here's a third group maybe you'll find yourself in. It's Pilate. Pilate represents for us someone who saw the truth but allowed other voices to overcome the truth. You know, um, Mark 15 says that Pilate wanted to release Jesus, but instead chose Barabbas because it says he was wanting to satisfy the crowd. Again, I won't make you raise your hand if you've lived that lifestyle, but we all have at some point, right? Wanting to satisfy the crowd. Luke 23, verse 23, gives a good commentary on Pilate. It says they were demanding with loud cries that Jesus should be crucified and their voices prevailed. Some of you have allowed all of the wrong voices to prevail for far too long in your life. And we have to learn as followers of Jesus to shut off the noise and hear only from the voice that matters. Shut out all the other voices and listen to the voice. And listen, the, the voice of God is rarely going to come as a thunderclap from heaven. It's more often going to come like he came to, the, to, to Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, a still, small whisper. Are you willing to tune out the noise and listen to the voice of God? Pilate let all of the other voices and his desire to satisfy people overrule what he knew to be true. And he imprisoned God and set free a murderer. Matthew 27 tells us that at this point, Pilate, when he decided to satisfy the crowd, brought out a basin of water and washed his hands. And he said, this man's blood be on you, which was, by the way, a statement of prophecy like Pilate had no idea. But he said, this man's blood be on you as he washed his hands. And he thought he was making himself innocent of this ruling and blaming the crowd. But listen to me very closely. All of us are responsible for the decision that we make about Jesus. Nobody else, none of your friends, none of the voices in your life are responsible for what you believe about Jesus. Well, my family and my connections and my church, yeah, all of that aside, what do you believe about Jesus? What do you, you have to make a decision. I have to make a decision. My kids have to make a decision. That guy on the street needs to make a decision. We have to make a decision. We are responsible for what we do, what we believe about Jesus. It's up to us. Court proceedings are pivotal for a society because they set a precedent and a tone for where, for where society is going, for where that culture is heading. And this is a pivotal decision because um, we're still talking about it 2,000 years later. And like we said at the beginning, Jesus, in a way, is still on trial in our hearts and in our, our heads today. In fact, I would say this. Everybody listening to this message, watching online, you will walk away today having made, having come to a verdict in your heart about who Jesus is. Everybody will walk out of here having made a decision. You go, I don't know about that because I'm not quite ready to form a decision. Maybe next Sunday. Here's how this works. Indecision is a decision. 
When you say, I don't know, you've made your decision. You said no. You pushed Jesus out. But here's, here's the good news. Number one, if you're a follower of Jesus, here's my challenge to you. Live like it. Listen, sin, we talked about this. Sin is lethal and illogical. It's going to make you live and do things that you shouldn't be doing. We live, I I meet too many Christians who are like weighed down warriors instead of victorious warriors that God has called us to be. It's time, Christian, if you believe in Jesus, to live like he's the mighty warrior we just sang about. Right? Now, for everybody else, you're kind of like on the fence about Jesus. You're making a decision right now. Here's the good news. If you've already made the wrong decision, it's not too late to switch your verdict. Today, Jesus goes, I don't care what you've thought about me for your whole life. Come on, let's party in heaven. I'll forgive you for anything you've ever done. There's no shame. There's no guilt. That is too hard, too long, too loud. Tune out all the other voices in your life and listen to the voice of the Father saying, come home. He's going to chase you down. And he loves you. He's got a plan for you. And all you have to do is say, God, I believe Help me to live like I believe it.